Good morning. Good morning. For any of you who were here seven weeks ago, just a reminder, August 1st is on Tuesday. We are back in Nehemiah today. Um, and I have to say that for me, uh, working in this chapter would have been a lot more difficult had it not been for Pastor Garrett's sermon last Sunday. Um, maybe you'll remember it. He was talking on the Lord's Prayer. And he made the one comment that when we read that, there's a lot of the pronoun our and us in there. He made the comment that's not a singular pronoun, that's a plural pl pr pronoun. And for some reason, <clears throat> never crossed my mind before, but it clicked then. Jesus is teaching us that prayer is a family affair, not just an individual affair. As I thought about it, I, it, it seems like this to me. Uh, for you, those of you who have kids, had kids, um, did this scenario ever play out for you? You come home and a kid runs up to you, daddy, 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 or mama, 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 if that's the image of God you bear. Can we go get ice cream? Common request. Question is, when they say we, what do they mean by we? Well, it's... It's easy to find out because all you have to do is say yes and watch the response. Yes, we can go get ice cream. And off they go. Everyone get your shoes on. We're going to get ice cream. So even though the child wanted ice cream, the request was for the family to get ice cream. So the whole family benefits from the request of one child for ice cream. And that's what I took from, from Garrett about... <clears throat> Prayer is a family affair. We're not just saying, God, give me my daily bread. We're saying, God, give your family our daily bread. So let's play that scenario from a different direction. However, how many of you have had this happen? You come home and one of your children come up to you and go, Daddy, you told us this morning that we had to clean our rooms today, and if we clean our rooms, we'd get ice cream, but we didn't clean our rooms today. I'm sorry, we failed you. We don't deserve ice cream. <laughs> okay, so probably what more likely happened is, Daddy, you told us to clean a room. I cleaned my room, but Johnny didn't. Can I still get ice cream? <laughs> yeah, that one's a little more common, isn't it? How come is it that when we're asking for good things, we're fine for it to be a family affair? But when there's confession, it's an individual thing at that point. You're on your own. But see, when we step into Nehemiah chapter 9, we find that there's confession going on, but we find that it's a corporate confession. It's a family confession. It's not just an individual confession. And that's important for understanding what's going on here today in Nehemiah chapter 9. So if you would, uh, flip in your Bibles or scroll on your device we are going to be in Nehemiah chapter 9. We start out reading thusly. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. <clears throat> and they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord, their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shabani, Boni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenaiah. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord, their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shabaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be the, your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. So there's a number of things that we can learn from this passage about what corporate confession is. The first one is pretty obvious. They start with humility. They are approaching God with humility. Like the song said up there we sang earlier, we pour contempt on all our pride. This is not a proud moment, this is a humble moment. Second thing they did is they separated from the foreigners. 
Now, our first reaction is to say that there was some sin involved in relating to the foreigners, but I don't think that's the case here. We read in Ezra where that happened. There was sin involving the, the Israelites interacting with the foreigners, but what we find was that it was based on marriage. See, God told the Israelites not to intermarry with the nations around them. God did not dislike having the foreigners there. In fact, he gave the Israelites rules on how to treat those who were foreigners, sojourners. There was no problem with there being foreigners in the land. They were not allowed to marry them. And so I don't think this is about a marriage issue. What I think is going on here is the Israelites know that they are dealing with a national issue. They're dealing with their sins and the sins of their forefathers. This has nothing to do with the foreigner among them. The foreigners have their own issues with God they have to deal with. The Israelites are saying this is a covenant people of God time for us. In fact, if you read in Jeremiah chapter uh, 46, 47, 48, 49, you see that God through Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a prophet right before the captivity, pronounced judgment on all the surrounding nations for their sin. So all the foreigners around them had their own issues with God they had to deal with. But this was a day for the Jewish people to deal with their Jewish nation issues with God. And I think this is important for us because we have to be careful. Oftentimes we gather together for confession and we think this is confessing the sins of our country. It is not. When we gather as the people of God for confession, it's for confessing the sins of the church of God. It's perfectly okay for us to decide to gather as Americans and confess the sins of our country, but that is separate. The sins of our country are not the sins of, our, of the church. They look the same sometimes because that's one of our sins is to let the world in. But we do not gather as a body to confess the sins of our nation. We gather as a body to confess the sins of the church, of God's family. This is a family affair. And they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their forefathers. Their sins, that's individually, me talking about with God about where I have gone wrong. And that's not my focus today, but that is a valid part of confession. They also confessed the sins of their fathers. And as we read through their confession, you'll see this. They're not talking about individual specific sins. They're talking about this way of life, this habit, this mindset, this stance that the nation of Israel had towards God that was continuously against God. And so they are confessing the sins of their forefathers. And we have to be careful here because this does not give us an excuse to say, well, I don't need to take part in this confession because I wasn't part of that. I struggled with this years ago. Um, when the promise keepers was a big thing. I went to one of the events and one of the speakers was like, we need to confess the sin of racism in the church. And at that point, I struggled with it. I'm like, I'm not racist. I don't engage in racist activity. I've got friends of all races. I don't know why I need to confess this. But see, I was thinking individually, not thinking like they were corporately. Yes, the church has been racist in the way it's executed and run things over the years. And yes, as a member of the church, I can confess that sin of racism in the church, regardless of how I have or have not engaged in that sin myself. <clears throat> these people here, these people here could have excused themselves for the same reason. We read in Jeremiah chapter 21, <clears throat> verse 8, this is God speaking to Jeremiah, speaking to the people. And to this people you shall say, thus says the Lord, behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out and surrenders to the Chaldeans who are besieging you shall live and shall have his life as a prize of war. You see, God through Jeremiah had told the people, if you surrender you will live. And so most of these men and women here, their father or their parents or their grandparents were men and women who had honored the word of God. 
in a time and in a culture that was ignoring the word of God, that had set up false prophets to tell them what they wanted to hear, that was persecuting the true prophets of God, these men and women had obeyed and honored the word of God. Their forefathers had done good. And yet none of them feel that's an excuse for them to exclude themselves from engaging in corporate confession for the sins of their forefathers for their nation. The truth is, is that I have done plenty that in the spiritual realm brings shame and disgrace on the family of God. In God's name, I am not excluded. See, the point of confession is two parts. The point of confession is acknowledging that there's a standard in the world. This is a yardstick. It's a standard unit of measurement that we use. And if I were to grab yardsticks from all around the country and set them up, they'd all be basically the same length. This is a standard we use. There's a reason why the phone in your pocket can have parts made from a dozen countries across three continents, and yet they all fit together and work together correctly because we have standards that govern how we specify things to be manufactured. There is a standard, and so they started with the law of Moses. They read the book of the law because that was the standard that they were to be measured by. The book of the law represents God, and God is the ultimate standard by which the entire universe, both seen and unseen, will be measured. And so they start. Because confession is, first of all, acknowledging that there is a right and a wrong, a standard. It's acknowledging that we fall short of that standard. Two parts. And so they confess and they worship. Same thing. I'm acknowledging that God is holy and just and righteous. And I'm acknowledging that when I measure up against God, I am not. So they confess and they worship. Because without the worship, we run the risk of confession not being confession. You and I walking down the hall and we bump shoulders. Oh, sorry, man, didn't mean that. That's not confession. That's just social politeness. We run the risk of being confession where I said something about you that you heard of. And I'm like, oh, sorry. Not because I've changed my mind about that or think what I said was wrong, but just I'm, I'm sad that you found out and I got called out on that. <laughs> Confession is there is a standard and I missed it. And so you have to have both and so they do both. They read the book of the law to see what the, the standard is and to acknowledge where they fall short of it. Confession includes acknowledging God's character, his holiness, his righteousness, his goodness, And confession includes acknowledging how God has acted faithfully and righteously in the affairs of his family. This is one of the things we do when we have testimony time. When people like Lilia and Ashley and Chris and Lily and Al and Helen stand up and talk about how God has been faithful in their lives, how God has been gracious and merciful in their lives. They're talking about how God has been faithful to his promise, to his word. When we share at Thanksgiving Eve service where we stand up and say, this is how God has blessed me and and what I'm thankful for about God, we're sharing how God has been faithful and active in our lives through the year. And as a corporate body, when we have our 40th anniversary celebration, we're talking about how God has acted faithfully and powerfully on behalf of our congregation for 40 years. Part of confession is acknowledging God's character and how God acts in accordance to his character. And so they make their confession, and the rest of the chapter is their confession. And I'm going to read it. I know it's long, but keep in mind, these guys are confessing out of their experience. So some of these things they talk about are stuff that doesn't resonate as emotionally strongly with us as it would with them. But we've got our own things where God has been faithful and and just and righteous in dealing with us, with our church, and with the global church of Jesus. So as you listen to it, think about the things that are more emotionally connected to you about how God has been faithful and how we have fallen short. 
So they start their confession and say, You are the Lord. You alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth with all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you pers- pres- preserve all of them, and the hosts of heaven worship you. They acknowledge God as creator and source of all things. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Gigashite, Gerashite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. So they acknowledge God as the promise maker and the promise keeper. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them, so they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day, and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws and good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. And so they recount to God how he has continued to act faithfully to them by their deliverance from Egypt and his provision for them in the desert. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies. You, in your great mercies, did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they, they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. So here they're acknowledging both their failure and God's continued faithfulness his mercy and grace through their failure. And you gave them kingdoms and people and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land of Shihon, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of the heaven, and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hands with their kings and the peoples of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities with rich land and took possession of houses full of good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in the great goodness. Again, they're acknowledging that God's maintaining his faithfulness to the promises he made and providing for them so that they were delighted in his provision. 
Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you and they committed great blasphemies. Therefore you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering they cried out to you and you heard them from heaven and according to your great mercies you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times you delivered them according to your mercies. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules which, if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through the, your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the land. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God." They acknowledge God's continuing grace and mercy. We call this long-suffering, that God puts up with us again and again and again and again. And now they get to the crux of their confession. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardships seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. You have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them, and in the large and rich land you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. And its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Did you see that? They're acknowledging God and his perfection, while at the same time acknowledging them and their wickedness and falling short. And they end with great distress. Seems kind of a sad place to end. But you see, when they were making their confession, they were leaning into God's promises. And though God promised them a number of times in the Old Testament, I want to look at a similar promise in the New Testament that we turn to. This is a promise found in 1 John. And if Garrett is correct, which I think he is, that we can read the Lord's Prayer and acknowledge the us and the are as being plural and related to the body, then the same thing holds true in this verse. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I fully believe this is applicable to us and on an individual level. If I, Kevin, confess my sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive me, Kevin, my sin, and to purify me, Kevin, of all unrighteousness. But I think it is also applicable at the family level. If we, the children of God, confess our sins, he, the Father, is faithful and just and will forgive us, the children of God, our sins, and purify us, the children of God, of all our unrighteousness. This is the promise they're leaning into. When we confess <clears throat> both God's righteousness and our falling short, we're inviting God to come in with his forgiveness and his purification. 
That's what we're looking for. This is actually a prayer for ice cream. All right? We can ask for what we want, forgiveness and purification, and that benefit flows out to the family because we're playing as a family affair. Now, I don't think there'd be anyone in here today who would say you want or you like the fact that God's name is disgraced in a world because of the way his family lives. No one here, I don't believe, would say they like the fact that Jesus' bride has blemishes on her because of the things we do and don't do, or that God's family has shame heaped upon it because of how we fall short of God's standard. So what do we do about it? Well, some of the easier things to do about it would be, one, just ignore it. Well, that happens out there. That doesn't apply to me. Nothing happening in my little world. We can isolate from it. Well, all those other people out there, they're doing it all wrong. We here, we've got it. We're doing it right. Let's just kind of stay here within our walls and keep everybody else out. We can isolate from it. We can try to police it. Go out there and tell everybody where they're wrong, where they should be doing this right. The problem is that always tends to devolve into an inquisition. Or we can do what God says. We can invite God to show up with his forgiveness and his purification. We can confess our family sins as a family and allow God to come in and deal with his family in a way that brings forgiveness and purification. So we're going to change things up a little bit. We're going to move right into prayer time. And prayer time today is corporate confession. If you look at your bulletin, you'll see that uh, we have listed a couple items where the church, through the ages, has fallen short of the glory of God. This is meant to be just a starting point. If you've been in church for any period of time, I have a feeling you've got some of your own that you've either experienced or seen where the church has fallen short of the glory of God. You know, when Brian first started prayer time, I remember him saying, he said, this is going to be awkward, but let's just lean into it. Confession can be the same way. This can feel awkward, but remember, we're doing this because we're looking for the promise on the other side of this. Okay? So this morning is not about confessing personal sins. This is not the time for it. There isn't time for that. This morning is simply us confessing, one, that God is righteous, holy, and just, and two, that we as a church, a global church of Christ, have fallen short of that. And we confess our failure so that God can come in with forgiveness and purification. Let's pray.